Say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. My mind is alert and my spirit is receptive to the living word of God in Jesus name. Amen and amen and amen. You're welcome to take your seats here this morning. Uh, one of the things that we've uh, found last week and one was one of our opening statements is that revival is for the church. If you revive something, it's because something uh, was alive and it died and you bring it back to life. Revival is for the church, but evangelism is for the lost. And last week and today I want to talk, uh, well, you know, a little bit about revival, but mostly about evangelism and why evangelism is so necessary from a biblical uh, viewpoint. So let's go over to uh, Luke this morning, Luke chapter 14, and I'm going to pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again over our time together here today. Father, I ask that this message would come out with your power and your glory on it, that it would inspire your people to rise to a new level. And Father, I ask for that thing to be accomplished right now in Jesus' name. And Father God, that your people would become uh, evangelists on a daily basis. They, they would see opportunities that they never saw before. Those that are here, those that are watching live, those that are here this message or see it on TV in any form or format. And Father, I thank you for that now and that no weapon uh, formed against anyone that would hear this message would prosper against them and keep them from this high call. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen and amen. Uh, Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 16. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. But verse 18, but they all like began to make excuses. The first one said, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. I don't know what happened to bringing her along. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once. Now, by the way, this thing about anger, it's real. I want to tell you as a pastor, I can tell you, and, and, and being in pastor's meetings, the anger that pastors share as a common bond that no one else understands their pain is the anger they feel towards people that are part of their congregations but are just not there or not there regular enough to be faithful and show their faithfulness. That anger is real, right? So, but this is referring to God. Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets in the lanes of the city and bring here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, master, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, go out to the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Now this is referring to heaven. And this is referring to those that are invited. There's several levels here. We could talk about uh, the nation of Israel and uh, the, the Gentiles around the world and how the nation of Israel was invited. That's one level that we're seeing here. But the levels that we're really seeing here as well are experienced Christians that after a while just decide that they're just going to drop out. This is a caution to people that have been saved for a long time not to stop what they began that was working for them 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Not to find excuses to not be in the household of God. There's another level that's going on here too, and I see this. In verse 23, and the master said to the slave, go out to the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in. Uh, Kathy and I were out in the mall the other day and we were walking around the mall and I carry the little books with me uh, most of the time. And so I'll have two or three of these books in my pocket and whether I'm wearing a coat or if I'm, you know, if it's summer, I have them in my, in my back pocket. And if I am talking to a clerk, I'll minister to that clerk briefly and I will say, 
you know, because I'll do this, I'll go, uh, uh, I want to give you a book, as long as there's not a line of 12 people and it's middle of, you know, Christmas season. So I just want to give you this book, is that okay? So I ask permission, and I go, what's your first name? Or I'll just say, I see your first name is, I want to write it in Hebrew, here's the book. Now I know I can't stand around and minister to them any longer, but there have been times where I just, they said, would you pray for me? Or I, st I looked around, I go, are, are you locked here? Do you have to go somewhere? No, I have to stay at the register. You mind if I pray for you? And I begin to evangelize towards these people. We were in the mall the other day, and I saw several people that I had evangelized already, that, and, and, and a couple of them said that they were going to show up for church, and they haven't been here yet. So they were kind of like, oh, okay, do I want to talk to this guy or not? And Because I've been in some of these stores frequently enough, you know, you know, maybe once every three to six months, but they know who I am, they see me on TV. And so... What I didn't do Friday, when I tell you that we need to do, is we need to compel people to come to church. What I should have done is gone like, forget the clothing that I want to buy, forget the shoes or the coat. You need to be in church and tell that, tell that clerk in front of maybe other employees there. They know what I'm talking about. They've already gotten the book. They've already gotten uh, my address. They've already saw me point, you know, our church is just right over there, over the hill. I mean, it wouldn't take you anything to find that and compel people to come in. And I think that we've been we're bold about our politics. We're bold about our gun rights. We're bold about a lot of things, but we don't seem to be bold about Christ anymore. In fact, the Bible tells us that uh, if you lead just one sinner out of his sin, James chapter five, you cover a multitude of your own sins. Man, I, I like that thought. I mean, I like knowing that just trying to evangelize is going to get people, is going to get people like me and you uh, just covered, to have covered a multitude of sins. Ask this question when you're out and about, if you're talking to people, where will you go if you die? And this is what you're going to hear because I've asked people this. Where do you think you're going to go when you die? And most people don't know. I, some people are telling me now, well, there's no heaven, there's no hell, you just die and that's it. That's what a lot of people are saying, particularly younger people. Some of the older people will say something like this, well, I kind of hope I'll, I'll go to heaven. And what I already know by what they're saying is they're not sure. And even though they may come from an evangelical background, they're still not sure. Evangelicals, you know, <laughs> preaching on salvation week after week after week, 52 weeks out of the year, you think after a while you would get it. But people just aren't sure anymore because they're not taught in a way where there's power. Most people don't know and they only hope to go to heaven. So I want you to picture the early church. The early church, uh, we had the temple. In Jerusalem, we had synagogues uh, in, in and around Israel and then outside of Israel, and then we had homes. And if you read the book of Acts, you're going to see the majority of the early churches, once they got the word out to a synagogue, the church would move. It, there would be a little Christian church started in someone's home, maybe a wealthy person's home, and they would invite people into their large home, and once two or three times a week, they would have church in that home. Not just on a Sunday or a Saturday as the early church was practicing it in Israel, but they would have church during the evening time. And then, uh, then those same people would go out and they would go to the synagogues. And the synagogue system is an interesting system. The synagogue system started, began around 800 B.C., and initially, it was if you wanted to worship God, you went to the temple, and then we had Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and, and the nation of Israel got divided, and so they set up temples in Dan and Bethel that were really uh, places of pagan worship. And the synagogue system began to build when Jews were on the road outside of Israel, when they, were, when they had moved out of the area or they had been transported out of the area uh, through different wars, through, through captivity. And then if they were also uh, traveling uh, militia, working for other governments and being paid to do so, then they would need a quorum of Jews and they would put a quorum together. They would begin a synagogue in a particular area outside of Israel. And that synagogue system was in place in Jesus' day. So once Jesus went to the cross, the disciples knew that the synagogue system that had existed and had been growing for 800 years 
is in place and all they had to do like what Jesus did is he walked into a synagogue. He frequently walked into a synagogue and he got up to teach and he said, this day has the scripture been fulfilled in your ears. And so the synagogue system was something that the Jews were already participating in. But the Gentiles weren't for the most part. You know, you'd have occasionally Gentiles that would go to the synagogues, but for the most part they weren't. So then in order to get those Gentiles saved, you would invite them to your home. You would have a Bible study and you would you would go over the scriptures, which is exactly what a Bible study is. Now, one of the things that we have in this church and we have available and, and I, I did I took two years to make up two whole years, worked on it for one hundred and four weeks, more than that, and made a workbook for leaders and for ministers, but it's a basically a two year long Bible study that's available here and anyone can, we'll give it to you for free if you promise to use it. And it has, I don't know, some 500, 600 slides in it with notes. And all you have to do is read the scriptures, read a note, and if you can't figure out anything else to talk about, move on to the next slide with the next notes and the next set of scriptures. And it's easy to have a home Bible study. And I took two years to develop that, and we finished it a couple years ago, and we used it in church every Wednesday night for about two years. So these things are available that we can minister to people that don't want to come to a church. Now, I'm going to take you over to um, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 9. And Jesus went on from there and he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? Right? So his disciples didn't know how to answer this. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, it is not for those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. All right. So Jesus is now dining with tax collectors, which were the low dregs of Jewish society. Yet uh, many Jews would, if they, if they saw a tax collector walk by, they would throw dust in the air. Uh, if you, if you touched a tax collector, you would uh, go home and bathe. He did all kinds of things to say how much I hate you. Because tax collectors were Jews. Frequently they were uh, practicing a lot of thievery. They were stealing and they, would, uh, they were like the enforcers for the Romans to collect taxes and no one liked them. And so here Jesus is eating with this group of tax collectors and many of them, I mean, morally probably didn't have much of a good moral background on top of the problem with the money. And Jesus is sitting there eating with them. And here's, here's what I'm thinking about. You've got a mission field right where you're at, right where Jesus didn't, didn't say, well, I'm not going to hang around certain types of people. Now, there are certain types of people you cannot hang around. All right. Let, let's face that. A little leaven leavens the whole lump and one apple spells, spoils the whole uh, barrel. But we can be in environments because that's where we're at. I mean, we don't have any other choice but to be in, in that environment. Maybe it's a work environment. Uh, maybe it's a uh, fitness environment. It could be a number of different things that we can, different environments that we're in, that we can minister to people. We can go there and we're not aloof from them. We're, we're just regular guys, regular gals, and we can be in there ministering to people. The thing that's really interesting is that Jesus did not send angels to these tax collectors. How many times have you prayed for someone to get saved? Man, I, I mean, I don't know, I, I've done it half a million times. I said, you know, God, I just really want that person to get saved. But I know one of the one of the prayers that God does not answer unless there is a human being in place to use is God can't 
and won't use the system of just simply praying for people to get saved. Now, if you're praying, if you got, you know, sons and daughters far away and you're praying that they get saved and someone comes across their path, that's a different story altogether. But sometimes we're praying for the person in the desk next to us to get saved when we're not doing, lifting one finger to tell them about our Jesus and about our church and about our Bible study and whatever else that we might have going on or inviting them out to dinner or to lunch and just, you know, to suggest to them that they're, you know, that their life could be better if they knew Jesus Christ. Now think about this. People expect God's angels by praying to reach the lost when God has given you and I that job to do. Think about this. Jesus came as a man, and what did he start doing? He started evangelizing. Once his ministry started, what did he do? He evangelized. He came as a man, and he evangelized. We are men. We are called the body of Christ. If we're the body of Christ, and Christ dwells richly in us, then his body literally should be evangelizing everyone else. We shouldn't be just praying. I don't have anything against prayer. Pray all you want. But then back that up with a little courage and give a book out, invite someone to church, let someone know that you're having a Bible study in your home. You have a mission field right where you're at. Non-Christians are interested in directions. I found a number of things about non-Christians that many Christians aren't interested in hearing. Unsaved people are open to hear what you have to say about the gospel, about prayer, about life, about Christianity, about creation, about the age of the earth. They want to hear the science. They want to hear the Bible. If you got it, they'll take it. Every opportunity that we have to mingle with other human beings is a soul-winning opportunity. Every opportunity that you have, whether it's at the store, you know, if you're an employer and you can't talk to your employees about Christ, I get it. All right. We don't want to be getting sued, you know, but there are opportunities to witness to all kinds of other people. There's all kinds of things that we can do. Let's go over to uh, Matthew chapter nine now and let's look at verse thirty five. Matthew 9, 35, Jesus was going through all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, look at that, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. One of the things that we also need not to worry about is praying for the sick. I don't see hardly anyone doing that anymore. In the, in the men's groups that I came up in long before I started this church, was that everyone was praying for everyone else. It was just commonplace. You'd see it happen everywhere. People praying for other people all the time and praying for them to get healed, not just praying for them. We need to be doing that. Verse 36, and seeing the people, he felt compassion for them. Why did he have compassion on them? Because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. Verse 37, and he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. You know, Jesus talked about in the book of Revelation, he comes and he said, I wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. There are people that they're, they're not getting in the way of the gospel. Say, so, I'm not getting in the way of the gospel, pastor. If you want to preach and send people out, go ahead. But on the other hand, they're not doing anything to support it financially, and they're not doing anything to support it in their homes or with personal evangelism. And so they are the ones that are literally holding Christianity back from increasing and growing. God needs bodies to preach. Jesus came in a body. The church is the body of Christ. And the church are you and I as believers. We're the body of Christ. I'm just going to give you some, uh, some quick blessings for being a soul winner. Let's go over to Proverbs Proverbs 27, verse 18, he who tends the fig tree will eat its fruit and he who cares for his master will be honored. Those who honor God by acknowledging his son, Jesus will be honored. Those who care for his master will be honored. If are we caring for our master when we're sharing the gospel? Absolutely. And those who care for his master will be honored. 
Who hinders the gospel? The Christian who's, either, uh, who's neither hot nor cold. They say, I'm here, I'm with you, but they're not really with you. They're not doing anything. I am so thankful that I was in a Amway meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1981. I'm not exactly what year. I have to go back and look at my records. And they had a big revival thing on Sunday morning. And so we were staying at the hotel right next to the Coliseum there. And, and the guy who I was with kept on pulling me and pulling me. Come to, I don't want to go to your church thing. And I went in and there, the place was full, 14,000 people there. And I'm up, up on 20, step number 25, way up high. I didn't want to be down close. And they said, if you stand up, if you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ. And I stood up and I walked all the way down and all the way up front and confessed the sinner's prayer. I was compelled to come in. And I know that that man has got to be receiving a blessing today because I was absolutely insane. As close to insane as you can get and still have a part in your hair. <laughs> and here I am now preaching. That man is getting that blessing today. And how about all the people that I've led, if I've led the next Billy Graham to Christ, I get the blessing, you get the blessing, and he gets the blessing. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's go over to uh, let's go over to Ecclesiastes, just a little after this, Ecclesiastes chapter eleven. Ecclesiastes eleven verse one Cast your bread upon the surface of the waters, for you will find it after many days. I know that if I go out and evangelize and go out and financially help people, help people pay their bills or just buy a meal for someone or give them a, a tank of gas, I know that that's coming back. And when we go out and evangelize, that'll come back for the rest of our life. Even coming back to us, if we're beginning to slide away, God will notice what we did formally. And he'll call us back and he'll be gentle and he'll get us back into his grace again. Amen. Now let's go over to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Verse 4, and gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. Okay, this is referring to Jesus, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you have heard of me. So now it's just switching back and forth, and you see that Jesus is talking if you have a red letter Bible. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Now, I want to stop and go back. He said this, verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait. But to wait for what the pro Father had promised, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And we know that after uh, Jesus went to the cross, it was 50 days later. We call it Pentecost. Penta meaning five or 50. And we went 50 days exactly, 49 days plus one, what's known as weeks. We went 50 days. There's Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit fell on everyone in that upper room. Let's read verse 7. And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times of the epochs by which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. And after he said these things, he was lifted up, and while they were looking on, a cloud received them out of their sight. Now the, the story goes on, but I just want to tell you that witnessing without the power of the Holy Spirit is frustrating and downright foolish. If you try to witness without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's just, it's insane. I have so much victory in witnessing to people. I do it all the time. And sometimes when I came home, like we were in the parking lot and I, saw, I turned to Kathy and I said, I got two books in my pocket that I didn't use. I could have used books 
just in shopping and going buying Christmas presents. We have this opportunity, but we can't do it without the Holy Spirit. Amen? Finally, I'm going to close it here. So we're going to give everyone an opportunity. You've never received, if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to give you at home watching an opportunity to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here, if you have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you want it, it's a simple thing. We don't dunk you in water. We simply pray for you and the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes on you immediately. Amen? For those that know. And finally, uh, I'm going to close it here in... Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Starting in verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who have no need of repentance. Let's all stand. There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Do you know that every single time you lead someone to Christ, I tell everyone this, that I lead to the Lord, I say, do you know there's a party going on in heaven right now? And they go, what? I go, yeah, the angels have this massive party when just one sinner repents. I said, Jesus said that. He said, you never, you, and, I, and particularly if I know they're partiers, you can just tell, you know. I said, you've been to some big parties? You don't know how to party like an angel, okay? And like all of heaven knows how to party. And there's, they're having a party upstairs because of you right now. Now, uh, I'm just going to do this, first of all, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want to do this personal time for everybody here. And all those watching live via the internet here this morning or watching us on TV. If you've never made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, you just need to get that done right now. It's, just, it's simple to do. So you don't get good and come to God. You just come to God and he'll eventually make you good. So if you like, if you're here this morning or if you're watching live or you're watching us on TV and you like to make Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, and I know that you do, I just want you to repeat these words after me as the rest of our congregation is going to do. Say, Dear Jesus, come into my heart right now and make me a new person, a new creation. I don't want to be that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, if you just made that decision for Jesus Christ and you're here this morning or you're watching live on the internet, I want to hear from you. Don't leave uh, today without uh, telling me. Uh, send me an email. Pastor at Mountain Faith will get you some materials right away to begin your new walk with Jesus Christ. The second thing that we want to do is this. We want to make sure that if you want to be a soul winner, that you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you'd like to do that this morning, it's real simple. We don't take very long to pray for it. Is there anyone here this morning that wants to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Just raise your hands. Anyone here today? If you're watching live via the internet here this morning, and if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you want to do that, stand to your feet if you're at home. Is there anyone here today? Okay. All right. I'm just going to pray for you at, uh, at home. And get ready, get ready. I'm just going to uh, believe that there's no distance in space and time for me to be next to you, whether you're watching on TV or watching live. Father, I command the baptism of the Holy Spirit to come upon all those that are watching right now. And I command that the power of God to fill them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. While the miracle signs and wonders and being get, go, be able to go out and preach the gospel. And seeing people get healed. And seeing people get saved in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen and amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap here today. Praise God.